I'm a bit embarrassed, not so much by the delay, but by the title of my talk, because I hate pathos and I hate titles that don't leave you an ironic exit. And uh, it's it, this title is almost abundant with um, how how little how little how serious it is, and that there's no no exit, no ironic exit possible. The joke is that there is no joke. I started at Republica in 2010 with mild sarcasm, uh, was uh, ambiguously wondering why the internet is shit, and I can summarize that very briefly in the fact that the world is shit, and I continued in 2013 by uh, trying to find three, no, ten ways to improve the world. And I'm essentially raising the same question today, but this time I didn't Google for answers. I looked in um, Erich Fromm's books. Because our, this year's motto is love, I was reminded of how I read Erich Fromm's book when I was a teenager, and how, how great the, I found that book, and that I might just read it again and tell you about it. The good and bad thing is that I loved it again, uh, uh, partly because it's really a great book and how much it impressed me when, when I was a teenager and how much it uh, confirmed the, my views of, of the life when I reread it. I can, I can only praise this book. The only, uh, only the, my only escape from the trap of seriousness is this cat video. <laughs> But it doesn't change anything about the fact that I'm standing here and have to tell you Erich Fromm's books are great, even though they're old, but they're timeless and to the point. Erich Fromm is my hero. And I stand here to uh, try to convince you of that fact. I didn't read all of his books, but many. And I think that he has a lot of good approaches to solving the problems of the world and to improving the world. And because he was a psychoanalyst, you can f he, he's showing us ways towards a happier, healthier life. I could s summarize all this and give you give you a terrible schoolboy's discussion of the book, but I don't have to because Wikipedia does it very well. Instead of summarizing what Erich Fromm has written, I'm going to tell you what I think I've understood. I'm going to give you the cherries that I picked from his book. Fromm says, by the way, that ideas only have a leave an impression on people if they are lived by the, those who teach them. Fromm did just that. He was very engaged in politics for the peace movement, and he lived his own values. I would like to be humanist. I can't be the judge of whether I can be, be or become one, and I can no, can't, can't tell you if, if I actually live what I'm going to tell you. I would. I've always tried to be nice and to believe in the good in humanity, and never preventing anyone from personal growth. But of course. Other people's perception may be different, but I'm going to leave it to you to find the discrepancies. But I seem to have pretty good filters for that kind of feedback. It took me seven years to finally understand that Andreas Schäfer thinks I'm the biggest leech in the world. Credibility aside, I'm going to start with Adam and Eve. Oops, wrong picture. The allegory of the exit from paradise was written by an unknown but very successful collective of authors many, many years ago. <coughs> Und 
And it's an allegory on the development of humanity and humans. Just like the development of embryos tells the story of our development, the allegory of the exit from the, from paradise shows our psychological development. It tells of the existential problems of humanity and mm. we're obviously part of nature but unlike many animals we're capable of, uh, of conscience and we get thrown into the world at some point and the story of Adam and Eve shows the central strangeness of humanity that's uh, being part of humanity but being unable to understand this because our, uh, our understanding of the world excludes us from paradise so like in a French existential movie, the greatest problem of humanity is its existence. So on a psychological level, we can see what Adam and what happened to Adam and Eve at the beginning. We're all one, a single, a single cell. So if we're pressed out of the womb too early, see Amy Schumer a lot earlier than a lot of other animals. So there are various animals that develop much further within the womb. So humans need a person or a baby bottle in their lives, but in this, this sense, we're, we're still in paradise. We can't we can't sense the difference it's all mine my bottle my world but there was this time when we weren't one with the mother so this is a kind of emancipation or moving away from the mother to become who you are and that's obviously where the problems start not only for Woody Allen but for all of us so if you're a generation of uh, caricaturists um, just commenting on the self-referentiality or the relation to ourselves. So we're looking for these relationships towards the father. Um, for instance, well, Fromm takes this a step beyond, and he says this, these relationships are what drive drive us. So uh, Freud similarly saw this drive, but for him it was a, se a purely sexual drive. So that was the Freudian slip as we know it. But the Bible uses a different different metaphor, the, the expulsion from paradise. So you can find resolution or a solution in this harmony and unification. So we have a, have a need to overcome this, this absurdity by moving towards this union and merger. So this leads to paragraph one of the German consti uh, constitution or the part of the um, American de Declaration of Independence, which claims that humans are capable of developing themselves. And all this reads a bit like a religious creed, and it may be that, but this common root of humans and this common uh, desire for for unity is felt in all of it from books if i had to summarize them all in in one word the one sentence would be, in order to become happier humans, we need 
to we need our capability for love, solidarity, courage, and work. Because these, uh, even though these capabilities are, are, are to be found in all humans, they don't necessarily grow by themselves. From says that that humans need to need the, take their their entire lives to to find themselves, uh, no, to to find their own to find their own birth, if you would. Uh, as he says that uh, there's only a very narrow set of, of conditions under which humans can reach this goal. Caroline Emke spoke very impressively about solidarity the other day and what it means in practice. She said those who are who are being attacked shouldn't need to defend themselves. We need others who stand up for each other, each, uh, for everyone's dignity. A society in which everyone only wants to save themselves is not a society, it's just a neoliberal spectacle. And that could have been taken from Fromm's books as well. Unlike from Emke once doesn't count this respect towards love, she says we don't need love, respect would be enough. That makes her right, but so is from who also wants solidarity, respect, courage to be part of love or the consequence of love. The concept of love after from is that nothing that happens to you or is, is not something that just happens to you or is part of partnership. It's an eternal challenge. It's not a place of um, of relaxation. He differentiates all of these, uh, all, all kinds of love from erotic love or paternal love. Or, mm. And uh, it's part of tolerance and the belief of the, in the good of humanity. All of these are dependent on each other and don't necessarily have anything to do with our common understanding of love. No, it, it does sound like I'm just standing in, uh, in front of a, of a school class. I'm going to have an F word for you to loosen it up, but you can feel free to close your eyes if you don't want to see it. Love. According to From, is a lot more than just erotic love. Two weeks ago, in the Spiegel magazine, I read an interview with the Tony uh, with Tony Morrison. If you want to read it as well, here's the URL. One of the questions to Morrison was that was about uh, the documentary I'm Not Your Negro, and it was and uh, she was asked if Trump was a good example of that ancient analysis. Now, I don't believe that uh, maturity is necessary to do with intelligence, and I don't really want to talk about the narcissist that is Trump. I was caught by that term, maturity. I tried to find a source for that quote by Baldwin, and instead of a quote, I found pure gold for a talk, pages and pages of quotations that I could be reading for hours, but I, this is the one I want to show you. Baldwin says that the place in which I'll fit will not exist until I make it. And this is essentially the same as from who says that we need to find, we need to take our entire life to find our own birth. Baldwin also says that you write in order to change the world. If you alter even by a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. 
I like this quote because it's a great, because it anticipates the next part of my talk, but it also mirrors many things that I and many others have said at Republica in the past days. If we can only change reality by millimeter, then we can change the world. The decisive, the crucial point is that the world is staging millimeter by millimeter towards good. But this is not always clear to see because this movement is being hidden by vibrations. I'm actually going to manage to get some home automation into this talk. These are the vibration because I collect the vibrations of sun on the 1st and 2nd of March. Of course, the sun is not swimming, it's not vibrating. It's it's our Earth that's doing it. But this is the first week of March, and you can see the tendency. And if you look at 15 days, you can see how the days get longer. And politically, it's very similar. There are ups and downs between the pills. Sometimes uh, the more progressive forces are at work. Sometimes it's the more conservative backwards force. But at least in democratic, in democratic societies, these movements are dampened by institutional or societal uh, resistance. And if you if you close your eyes a bit, you can if, you can see how we progress as a society. These kind of jokes from the 50s or these ads from the 50s no longer work today. No matter how subtle the joke may be, there are still many people who wish we still lived in a time when these kinds of ad, ads were normal. But as a society, I believe that we've moved far away from this kind of jokes in the past 60, 70 days. Instead, we see trans people on TV as perfectly normal people, not as freaks. At least one gay couple is, has been part of a very successful family comedy on ABC that belongs to the Disney company. 20 years ago, the coming out of Ellen DeGeneres was a big scandal. And it, so, many, so many viewers complained that the show was taken off TV eventually. Of course, there is still resistance and there is still radicalization against this kind of societal change, but I believe that the direction is right, even if there's always a regression after progress. Fromm thought the same thing. In the, ten, uh, in the 70s, he wrote that, uh, the, that we saw historic changes that, are, that seem nearly irre irreversible. The sexual revolution was called successful even if it was still in its infancy because many uh, things had already been accepted by the majority and the old I ideologies become more ridiculous by the day. I conclude that ideas and norms of minorities can have, can be successful in society if they are borne out by um, humanity. Today we see a transformation of language towards, um, towards more towards more inclusive language. And of course, we still see resistance that we can even see in our own filter bubbles every day, but this, this resistance to linguistic change is the most unintelligent resistance imaginable because language does develop because it lives, because it's alive, and it's only alive because we all use it and because generations and generations have have changed, they've also changed language. Resistance doesn't change language. Language changes when it's, be, when it's filled with, li uh, with life. <coughs> so to move away from this negative, inhuman attitude, I think there are just little screws, maybe, in a linguistic sense, where, what we can actually do. So the connection to language is, is clear. 
We've heard a lot about hate in the last few times or so for, for from hate is a is a symptom. It equals a lack of self love. And I would have liked to show you a quote from Pumukel, the popular German kids figure. So he basically said the same thing, so it must be true. So narcissism or self is not identical to self-love. He says from, he says, just have a loving interest towards, directed towards your own person. And unhappiness could be this... <clears throat> Sorry. Well, the, the uh, question that uh, from answers, where does this hate come from? This lack of self-love and, of course, from the universe and all the rest. So, but this uh, question regarding the reasons, maybe we're looking in the wrong places or not looking at uh, sophisticated answers and the complexity but uh, Fromm does, does remind us not to start uh, looking at others if we want to solve the problems of the world, but start with ourselves, with this active love, or maybe a bit more, with a bit more pathos. We should examine ourselves, how many of the things in the world that that annoy us, that we feel provoked to do something about, how much are they part of ourselves also? And there are other parts that I, well, I'm not um, not as supportive of, but um, the point is having is more prominent in our society today than being. So Fromm says he can't see any vision in society except for wanting more. So the answer to the question whether um, consume, consumer attitude can give you some kind of fulfillment, he definitely de denies that. So our economy isn't, isn't determined by the question what is good for the huma humans in society, but what is more efficient for for the economy maybe so we'd have to we have to reduce ourselves or focus on our own attitudes and convictions and so if we stop growing stop gr getting m more mature this this is a kind of infantile regression we can observe in today's information and media society i'm not uh, I don't enjoy this kind of generalized media, new media criticism, but I would like to highlight a few points, albeit in a slightly more positive way. So if we are trying to become independent personalities, not only following the herd, but also liberating ourselves from our fears, these media do give us more opportunities than ever before maybe but these aren't only just soap bubbles we can we can really make an impression we can uh, advocate for social change well and social change is always especially powerful if if the initial spark is a humanist one is not a destructive one and this is obviously not a new not a new phenomenon so we have a lot of humanist projects that ended up as anti-humanist projects, really. So this is a question of attitude or taking a stance. We don't need preach preachers. We have we have celebrities who keep keep the the media society running the consumer consumer society, but that an, one single person can touch a whole strata of societies. This, this has always been the case, maybe in fashion, royalty, someone must have started at some point centuries ago to wear silly wigs or one of these hats, and someone must have started this trend and said, I'm brave enough to to wear this for the first time. Who was the first person to wear shoulder pads in the 80s? 
suddenly you weren't you're ridiculous anymore. So I'm repeating myself, but I think society can be improved and changed far more easily with positive changes. If you think of, well, if any one of you has ever had anything to do with, with kids, children have never been good at listening to their elders. But they will imitate what you, the life that you present to them. I believe if we all work on improving ourselves and to finding ourselves and to get rid of illusions, then we can be set better examples for others. Self-optimization is a sort of trend. We count steps, calories, not always, but mostly to impress others. This may partly be due to the fact that we haven't really found a way to collect the right metrics. How do you measure humanity? How do you, how do you measure happiness, friendliness? Where are the apps for these? Or to ask another, to ask this, the same question in a different way, why do we still feel weak when we ask for help to solve deep-seated problems and to work on our capability of loving ourselves or others in a better way? Our heroes are those who work on their exterior, but not those who work on their humanity. Your human qualities, working on your human qualities is no different than learning to ski. And like learning to ski, it's tough work, but it leads to a better quality of life. There is another quote from uh, Imke that I want to bend to my will. She spoke of being able to work towards social majorities. It's not fast, it's hard work, it often needs self-criticism, but that's exactly what political work is. I would say that the travel, the journey to your, towards your inner self is also political. Meister Eckhart says that humans shouldn't think so much about what they do, they should think about what they are. We should simply think more. It's not like we don't think, but sometimes we just we, we don't actively think. We often let media stream passes, we react, react and like, it's uh, already already liking acoustically when you go to a theatre is seen as progressive. Or if you read a book or if you, if you travel and look at um, uh, tourist attractions, but these are mainly Passive, passive, passive things. Erich Fromm was a Jew, but he um, he didn't practice, and he he praised the, the the Shabbat, which he said is a peace, is a way to restore harmony between humans and nature. Nothing must be destroyed or built. It's a day of armistice in the war between humans and nature. Sunday, in, uh, on the other hand, is a day of consumption and escape from your from your own self. Maybe we should take this day each week to find ourselves and not to escape from ourselves. Instead to work on ourselves and our capabilities and our fears. I'm a fan of TV shows. I use this nice tool to count them. And I can see that I spend way too much time watching television. 
In peak times, I have about 37 TV show, shows per month. I rationalize this by um, by telling myself that I need to watch these to review them on my blog. When I visited family recently, I discovered a parallel, and I discovered that watching TV on mobile devices and streaming TV especially is a brilliant way of blocking out uh, blocking out children's noise and this is a kind of pacifier for adults it's a way of running away from her own self. To show you what I mean, uh, this quote of James Baldwin is great. People can cry much easier than they can change. We, we prefer to, to use other experiences of our own. Of, uh, we prefer television over introspection, but I don't like to be told by others that I watch that I consume too much media. So ignore everything I just said. It's not a criticism of your streaming media habits. Do whatever you want. But if you take a step, step back and watch yourself, then you do notice things that you ought to change. I don't want to say that we do something wrong, at least not in that in a in an obvious way. I don't want to say that actionism or political enga engagement is wrong. I simply want to impress on you that we need to get rid of social of preconceived notions and we need to get rid of our own rationalizations. We're already okay, I'm, I firmly believe in that, but there are peaks up, down, left and right. But we have potential, a lot of potential in ourselves. And if we can leverage that potential, then we can help others discover their own potential and to use that, that potential. I think having potential is one of the, the greatest things in the world, but we don't need to look for answers. We especially need to raise questions. This is the last question of James Baldwin's I'm about, um, I'm going to abuse. We should try to find questions that are hidden by the answers. Thank you.